This is, as Chaim said, this is the fifth year of the i and I'm very pleased uh, that our colleague Peter Leonard agreed to join me uh, in the first talk for our bi-weekly colloquium uh, here at the Center for the Study of Conversion and Interreligious Encounters at Ben Gurion University of the Negev. Uh, to those of you who are unfamiliar with Peter, uh, he is a member of the Center Honoris Causa, uh, and he has been an uh, avid attender of the seminar for the past five years now. You should, as Chaim said, this is the fifth year of the seminar. I know very well this is the fifth year of the seminar because when the seminar first met uh, down the hall in the history uh, department's small uh, seminar cell, um, I, uh, when I presented one of the first papers in the seminar, I used an 11 size font. Today I'm using a 16 size font, so I know exactly that five years have passed and my <laughs> eyesight has deteriorated uh, in tandem. Um, so um, the reason we came to share some of our uh, research with you is because we taught a course uh, last year together, uh, thanks to the dean who was willing to uh, accommodate for such a uh, novelty in this faculty. Um, and we had we taught together, and one of the texts that we taught during this seminar is the text that we're going to be presenting to you today, uh, which is, uh, in my mind, um, an interesting um, meeting point between the issue of interreligious encounter and conversion, and the question of what constitutes conversion, especially when no conversion is mentioned in the text, uh, which is very interesting in and of itself. The text we will discuss shortly is one of the texts we taught, as I said, and it is by no means a prime specimen. Um, it's far from being an exemplary model. Uh, in many ways, it's more of a riddle. Uh, than anything else. It's fragmented. The second half of the text is missing, as you will see. It's abruptly cut in the middle, uh, so we don't have the end of the story. It's a story building up to a climax, and then suddenly uh, it stops. And, and, and in this respect, it's, it's more of a riddle and, and a conundrum than anything else. But for the matter concerning us here at the center and our interest with the spectrum between interreligious encounters and the question of conversion, it's a good example of the many issues we came to discuss over the past few years. Um, the text focuses on members of the two religious groups uh, that are discussed in the text, Jews and Christians, cohabiting in a rather in rather close quarters, a small walled city on the southern outskirts of northern France during the last decade of the first millennium. Uh, one of the many questions our text raises is what exactly <coughs> defines the belonging to one religious group and when exactly does an interreligious encounter turn uh, from the stage of curiosity, flirt, fluke uh, with the other religion, and a conversion occurs. Um, so let's just take a look at the lecture's outline. Oh, and it's governed by this, I guess. Okay, so. yeah. Okay. Here we go. Mm -hmm. yeah. Shortcut. No? No? Maybe this? Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, so this is what we have in mind. Uh, we want to give it, start with the mythological reflection which Peter will give uh, on the literalization of Jewish Europe. Um, we're going to discuss the letter itself, the text that is a le in letter form, um, its historical location in its place. Uh, we're going to look at the place of this letter in literary history, the genre of a letter of deliverance, uh, which is typical the, the, the exact genre that this letter is uh, taking form in. Uh, we're going to try and reevaluate um, Jewish Christian society as a non boundary society in, in, an, in a context where there are no boundaries. And we're going to try and convince you that uh, northern France in the le late 10th century has some features of a um, area where two members of the two religions meet and the boundaries are extremely blurred, or at the very least, this is what the text is trying to project onto its listeners and readers. Um, then we're going to follow with a reevaluation of the language style uh, in this first stage of um, literalization. And finally, uh, we're going to look at the test case. Part of the text discusses a murder case. Uh, that's why how I got to come into it, because I deal with um, Jewish crime in medieval Europe, and this is one of the uh, good fine specimens of a murder case from uh, very early on in the Jewish um, existence in northern France and in Europe in general. And uh, I was um, 
mesmerized by uh, this case. I found it very, very intriguing. And what we're going to do is look into the murder case, the section of the murder case. There's more to the text. You can read on. Um, there's both an English translation of the text if you want to follow the English and in Hebrew uh, is circulating. Um, it's written in very, very um, high Hebrew. Peter is going to discuss that. So. Um, this is more or less the outline of what this lecture is all about. Usually the second question which we raised, uh, when does a religious conversion occur, usually that has a very simple answer. Uh, this is especially true in the religions that have prescribed rituals and in uh, initiation procedures for the transformation from one religion to the other. Um, over the past few years we have wrestled with questions of intent, with the question of what enables a real transformation, what is a lapsed conversion, but in many of our discussion, there was always that definitive moment of crossing a well-defined ceremonial, usually publicly announced threshold, marking the transfer. Um, but what if the evidence we have makes no mention of such a ritual? Although the text we discuss is clearly set in a time such rituals exist. Uh, what happens when there is no mention of an act constituting conversion from one religion to the other? As we shall see, this is but one of the many questions uh, that this short fragmented text leaves us with. And now I turn over to Peter. Okay. okay. So, the first question here is, if we ask for the literalization of the Jews <coughs> in Europe, is the transition in from late antiquity to Middle Ages from library culture to religion of the book, one book. So the, the uh, dismissing of the big libraries, of the large libraries of antiquity, of late antiquity, in, uh, in about 500 we are living around the Mediterranean in a culture of the book, not of books. And this is very interesting for if we, if we look for the numbers uh, 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 of the numbers of books. When we speak about early medieval libraries, we're speaking about 500 books. This is a big library, Cordova accepted, okay, public libraries in Baghdad and, uh, and so on. But in all other places in, in Western Europe, we have to deal with the, uh, the lack of literacy in, in, in existence of books. And this brings me to the question, what is the part of the country we are speaking of, of uh, the area of Western, uh, Northern Western Europe, speaking about uh, literary production. And here I want to int introduce one uh, term that we have to speak about the late antiquity fertile crescent of literary production in the Near East. Almost all the texts we have coming from somewhere in Mesopotamia up to Egypt were written and became the, the, the uh, basic of the Christian library and so on. But we have, all, we have also some other centers. We have southern Italy for transmitting antique literature. We have northern, uh, northern Africa. We have in Spain. We have in um, southern Provence. And we have one hotspot outside of the Roman Empire, and that's Ireland, for uh, collecting books reproducing books and bringing them afterwards back to, uh, to Europe. So if we are speaking about uh, the area of uh, central France, they have one, uh, uh, they have one very important uh, uh, point in there uh, f for them, that is location, location, location. They are between the Scots of Ireland and, the, uh, and, southern, and southern France. So France, for example, also in French Judaism, they are a hundred years earlier than Ashkenazi Ju Judaism in Rhineland areas and, and eastwards, simply because there were more books, more books in life, and uh, the, the steps, uh, other steps in writing. Are there steps to understand the beginning of local cre uh, literary creativity in European Middle Ages? Yes, I think there are. If you, if I, I worked on the Roman of Alexander, so I see first of all a, t a, 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 a pattern of acquisition. A book comes to a place, and is uh, and is copied uh, and uh, is it multiplied in in this place, mainly Bible, the book, and liturgies. 
But then afterwards, beginning uh, after a period of 100, 150 years, begins a, a, a way of autochthonous writing. Local matter in local language and local literary forms are produced. <laughs> This is a, a great step. If we see the Talmud coming to the to Western Europe uh, from the southern Italy, it takes sometimes about hundred years from uh, acquisition of the text to writing or writing around the text. So the first steps I found, especially around the Roman Alexander, but in many uh, other cases as lit liturgical liturgy, uh, literature too, the first thing is copying, accepting and arranging. Not every book is for me, even if it comes over overseas, I'm not copying it if, I'm, uh, if, I, uh, if I have no use for it. I'm accepting it in those parts that are useful for me, for example medical information or something like this, or I'm arranging it according to my li way of life uh, as, a, as a collection, uh, as an anthology for me. The next step of going in contact with this text is commenting or and translation. The contrafactura, the, the first text that I get a text from overseas and I'm trying uh, to put with glossaria, trying to, uh, to live with this text in a strange language or afterwards translating it and using it. And the next step is creative response. That the, that the local community of, of book users begins with a creative response, creating books out of Tono's writing. I just want to bring uh, some, uh, some examples from the European literature. Every, almost every one of these cycles, I'm, I'm, I uh, try to recall here as matters of France, for example, have oral traditions in their background, but they are written down in dialogue with, with literary forms that came from Latin literature uh, and so on. So we have the matter of France, this is uh, Carolingian cycle, uh, Song of Roland. We have the matter of Breton, uh, the Br of Britain, the Arturian uh, cycle. We have the, the matter of Germany, uh, this is Nibelungen, the Kriemhild and the Gudrun cycle. We have the matter of Rome, the Aeneas Roman. Uh, we have the matters of Greek and we have s something very nice. In almost every European language we have the matter of the land of literarization. Where did you learn r reading and writing? Yes, with with the uh, with the uh, with Aesopus, uh, with the fables of uh, Aesop. So the question is, um, what, uh, what uh, we are uh, we are uh, we are uh, announced to ask what is happening with the Hebrew matter? What's happening in Hebrew culture in Europe uh, parallel to these uh, to this way? And I just want to bring some something very simple. You, uh, the Ashkenazi culture began to write when there was not enough salt or too much salt in the stew. Until then, they were getting the, the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, they're getting the Hebrew prayers, and I write it here in Hebrew just to show that this was parallel to what's happening in the non-Hebrew uh, culture. They got books, small books, uh, professional uh, uh, tractates. They were beginning, the first thing they were beginning to write in was liturgical poetry, dated. They were writing uh, uh, accordances for their public life. They were writing commentaries. And only afterwards, after 1096, we have German Ashkenazi characters staring, acting, uh, and writing in autochthonous writing in, in Ashkenaz. So the text we want to speak about is these hundred years earlier mm -hmm. in France, when in France, in gallo -Frank, uh, franken uh, countries, literacy, literacy is much higher. The use of texts or writing about oneself is very much more in common. And so this is the first um, this is the first uh, methodological step, to, to be aware that every, not everybody who is using a book is writing, is writing a book. Not everybody who is writing a book is writing a book about his situation, about his world, about her world, uh, and so on, just to bring a case. So now we want to go to, this, uh, to the background, the historical background and place of this letter. Okay, so um, the text we are about to discuss, which you have in front of you, is in Unicum. Uh, it exists only in one copy, in a manuscript from the Palma Palatina uh, Library. Um, in, it's called um, Manuscript 2342. Uh, all we have 
of the text, of the original text, was copied directly or indirectly from this Parma manuscript, uh, in the 14th, which is written in 14th century Gothic hand, probably from in and around the time uh, Jews were expelled from northern France in 1306. So this is either part of an attempt to collect northern French works and put them in writing before the Jews are expelled, or as a reaction to the expulsion of 1306, an attempt to kind of put together uh, an anthology of material of a community that basically ceases to exist. Um, our text is clearly a copy uh, of a pre-existing text, uh, and the text professes it um, originated from the year 992. Um, I'll just show you um, what the text looks like. Um, this is the Parma manuscript itself. It's on the two last pages of this manuscript, uh, the uh, manuscript MS 2342, um, three pages, and it ends abruptly. Um, it's suddenly at the top of the page, usually very odd. At the top of the page it ends, and there's no continuation. Um, uh, back in uh, the 19th century, um, Avram Berliner produced a, uh, the first edition of the text and kind of read it, how would we say, um, with a lot of uh, salt and pepper, he kind of edited the text a bit, uh, added some of his uh, interests and, and thoughts into the text, sometimes not reading exactly what the text uh, uh, itself says. And the second edition we have is uh, by Avram Habermann, uh, printed in 1946. Some of you may be familiar with it. It came out in a booklet called Gzerot Ashkenaz Vetzalfat. Uh, right after the Second World War, kind of resonating um, the Jewish history in a very powerful way, saying that what is what went on in Europe in the past five or six years is basically part of a long continuum of persecutions and in an attempt to show that the persecutions are European lead, uh, uh, are all over Europe, uh, Habermann collected also texts that include this northern French case from the year 992. Notice the fact that uh, we have two dates here. One is Daled Alafim Tafshinun Daled, in other words, 994 and 992. This has to do with the dating of the text itself. Um, the text professes, it describes events that took place in the late 10th century northern France, the year 992 to be exact. The date is given to us in an anno post destructio form, uh, nine year, 924 years after the second destruction. Uh, Jews calculated the destruction to 68 AD, and not as we do, to 70 AD, hence the difference in the two years uh, between the first date and the second date. Um, I would like to point out the fact that this um, uh, system of uh, dating is typical of Jews, and we have a few other examples of using this same method of dating, uh, which eventually becomes obsolete. Jews uh, shy away from this uh, method of dating. So in this respect, um, this gives us a, a sense that the text is authentic when it professes that it actually dates back to the 10th century. Uh, the dating system was commonly used by Jews in the first millennia after the great Jewish wars of the first century. Uh, here you have um, some uh, um, examples from uh, epitaphs that were found in southern Italy. Uh, and here you have a text from southern Italy, uh, the text of the scroll of Achimats, uh, dating to 1054 that uses, when it describes historical events, the same kind of dating system. Uh, here it's Bishnat Shmone Mochanim Le'ir HaKodesh Limlot Churbanim. So 800 years to the destruction. Um, as stated earlier, our text focuses on events that took place in the early years of the Capetian monarchy, uh, the years of the reign of Ig Capet, the first monarch from the dynasty designated a king of the Franks, Rex Francorum. Uh, and during this time period, uh, the political entity that we uh, that will eventually become the Kingdom of France did not yet exist, and the area of modern-day northern France was divided between several political units, uh, as can be seen from the following maps. And this is a map I took from a, uh, uh, a Spanish website, so excuse the uh, uh, Spanish uh, uh, 
pronunciation of some of the political units, but you see that the blue represents the area under the control of the Capitines, and the other areas are uh, counties and duchies under uh, other uh, political entities. Uh, the two cities we're going to be concerned with are Blois, over here, and Limoges down here. Blois in the county of Blois, and Limoges in the dukedom of Aquitaine. The pointer doesn't work. Ah, 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 I'm sorry. Okay. Blois and Limoges. Okay. Blois in proper northern France, and Limoges, as the text professes itself, uh, on the outskirts of northern France. This is not really part of northern France. It's way in the middle uh, of France. Um, pertinent to our discussion are the cities of Blois and the Loire Valley, uh, and the city of Limoges on the backs of the Vin in medieval times, part of the Duchy of Aquitaine, where the lion's share of the events discussed in the text took place. Um, if the professed dating of the t document is correct, and there is good reason to believe it is, we are talking about a time before uh, the wave of anti-Jewish persecutions that swept northern France during the first decade of the 11th century, especially between 1007 and 1009. Um, these events touch several Jewish settlements in northern France, including an incident in the city of Limoges itself. Uh, according to Adam of Chabin, a monk at Limoges Abbey of Saint Martial, who wrote in the late 1020s and early uh, 1030s, uh, Alduin, the bishop of Limoges, in the first decade of the second millennia, offered the Jews of his diocese the choice between baptism and exile. Uh, for a month, theologians held, held disputations with the Jews, but without much success, for only three or four of them actually converted. Others killed themselves, and the rest either fled or were expelled from Limoges. Uh, we should take this evidence with a grain of salt, for Adamar is known to be somewhat fraudulent in other um, aspects of his work. Uh, he, for instance, was behind the common notion that spread in Aquitaine that in, during the 11th century that Saint Martial of Limoges was actually an apostle um, and part of uh, the uh, distribution of Christianity uh, dating back to the times of Christ. Um, of course, pepping up the cult of Saint Martial of Limoges uh, um, and this, of course, was um, exposed as a fraud. Uh, we may say, however, that we what can be gleaned from the Hebrew document we are focusing on is that there are neighborly relations between Jews and Christians as described in the text alongside, and this is also also very uh, uh, pertinent to our text, animosity and, and a lot of um, um, tension. Um, over half a century ago, uh, Robert Chazen has argued, had argued, that since the Hebrew spelling of the city in our story is Limonish, Lamed Yud Mem Vav Nun Yud Yud Shin. Um, sin. Sin, yeah. Um, here. Oh, 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 wait. Oh, no, I, yeah. to no, no, I want to go back to just show you yeah. the, the text inside. Uh, and you have it in front of you. Um, it may well be that the events refer to the locality of La Mans. Uh, we are under the impression that the community at the center of the text is indeed Limoges and not La Mans. Uh, the events described fit with Limoges in many ways. Uh, La Mans is less probable of an option since in the late 10th century, La Mans is still referred to as Mans, not La Mans. Uh, it's only after the Capitan expansion of the 11th century and the inclusion of other cities with similar names like Amiens uh, and another Mans in the Duchy of uh, Champagne that the city changed from Mans to Lama, uh, giving it a, 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 a different name, creating the possibility raised by Chazen of the Hebrew misrepresentation uh, uh, of Limonish. Uh, we should also bear in mind that the Hebrew writing of the text represents the Romance pronunciation of the name of the locality, obscuring the written letter G in the uh, writing of the city Limoges. As we shall see, there are other details, um, both historic and geographic, uh, that seem to firmly support our understanding that the text refers to Limoges and not to La Mans. Important to our discussion, uh, or to the document, as well as to the story embedded in it, is the fact that Limoges was home to the Abbey of Saint Martial that rose in significance and became very uh, important as a site of pilgrimage. Um, and we should go to, oh, okay, yeah, okay, no, okay. No, no. okay. Um, The tomb of the third century San Martial drew many pilgrims to the city. According to Gregory of Tours, San Martial was one of the seven bishops sent from Rome around 
250 to preach the word of God to the Gauls and convert them. Uh, the famous Saint-Denis of Paris and Saint-Martial of Limoges were two of these Episcopal emissaries. Um, the abbey that developed on the site of the burial of San Martial grew in importance and elaboration alongside the city of the castle, referred to in the Hebrew text as Habira. Habira, not to be confused with the capital city today, but we're actually a walled city. Okay. Um, Limoges, Limoges was also a major commercial center under the patronage of the abbot and outside the boundaries of the control of the cathedral city, dominated by the bishop. As its tomb became progressively more important as a local pilgrimage site, the, the monks of San Martial found patronage in the Benedictine order uh, already in the mid 9th century in uh, 848. And during the 9th century, this abbey became an essential stop for pilgrims en route to uh, the tomb of St. James in Compostela. Thus the city benefited not only from the local pilgrimage to this tomb of San Martial, but also to the wider pilgrimage traffic throughout Western Europe. Uh, as can be seen from the map, it sits very nicely in the middle of the road over here, used by this, uh, uh, this route over there. Now, by the 10th century, these facts translated into San Martial becoming home to a great library, uh, second only to the library of Cluny, um, and an important scriptorium, as well as a collection. And as Peter mentioned, when we're talking about libraries, large libraries, uh, we're not thinking of anything the size and magnitude of our uh, rather <laughs> depleted library over here, uh, but something of a much more modest form, um, probably several hundred uh, um, copies of books, uh, sometimes maybe scrolls, uh, and a very uh, active scriptorium. The scriptor uh, scriptorium developed from the early 10th century, and the reason I'm uh, putting an emphasis on it is because um, it actually resonates in our text. Um, when the murderers that we will be discussing shortly uh, uh, that were hired by the text protagonists were not paid, although they performed their job, and they had to flee Limoges because of their identity being compromised, they sent a letter to the person who hired them, uh, threatening to use violent means on the highway to Limoges if uh, he fails to pay them. Uh, the threat targeted specifically people en route to the Abbey of San Martial with direct references to books produced in the monastery. And if you want to look at the uh, text in front of you, um, I have it also on the slide, so you don't really have to. כה אמר פלוני ופלוני המרצח, שלך לנו מזכורתו, אשר קראת עמך בהורגו הנפש בגללך, קור כסף וכוס צלמה. כי אם אין, if you do not, if you fail to comply, בלכת שם איש מזה והלאה נושא ספר ומרתלותו. Many of, uh, of the people who read the text previously uh, changed this short Mar reference to Markulto. Markulto meaning his merchandise, but I think that this is not a scribal error. Uh, we have a difference on this, but I think that this is a direct reference to the fact that Limoges is the home of the Abbey of San Martial, and within the Abbey of San Martial there is an active library and a scriptoria, hence the books, the, the books are en route. In other words, not every monastery in Europe has people flocking in with books on their in their possessions, San Martial happens to be one of those. So I think this is a direct threat to the actual traffic to and from um, to and from the monastery. Hence, uh, our, um, sticking, we're sticking to our guns saying that this text discusses Limoges and not Le Mans. Okay. Um, and now, uh, hold on. Yeah, yes. now it's up to you. Okay. So, <clears throat> we have now a place, we have now uh, a time, and now I have only to come to just to speak about the genre of the text or the plot uh, and what we can learn about this text, because it's a fragment. And then we have to go uh, and to <coughs> and swift over to, uh, to more general knowledge about these kinds of texts to understand what part of, of the text we have before us. 
So first of all, the disposition, we have a text that in, has an, introdu an introduction written after the case, written to publish a case of, of God's deliverance to a community that is aware that it's living in the exile and gives a date and gives the name Limones, uh, Limones uh, and so on. But then it begins to develop the, uh, the plot, a full of bad conduct, Sechok ben Aster, the Israelite, and this will be very interesting why he gives these details of his name, a place with a tiny Jewish community, Limoges, is introduced, and then happens a case of murder of a Jew initiated by uh, the protagonist, the bad guy, Sechok uh, ben Aster. To, in, to defend himself and to bring the thing, things to uh, to peak, he uh, puts a rachapuppe, a wax figurine of the uh, local duke, brings it into the synagogue and put and hides it in the ark of books in the, near the scrolls, and uh, claims to be before the duke that the Jews writing uh, magic uh, text uh, to kill him. In the end, this brings to a, to, to a way that a single combat to bring it, this case to trial is uh, demanded. The Jews try to bribe the Duke, but they are unable to, uh, to do it. Then we have some three crazy lines, I, I uh, pointed them out in the grey background. And then we have the peers' uh, response of the community to this kind of stress, fast and prayers. Yes? And then we have the speech, uh, uh, the, the sermon of a monk who is asking uh, that the Christian community will stand to the Christian measure of Christian revenge for killing, uh, of killing uh, Jesus. Here the text breaks up and this is the question now what kind of text we have before us and this is not only the language but also the structure of the text give us the uh, allusion to the book of Esther where we have an introduction where we have a complication we have a turning point and a resolution and we have a conclusion which con uh, contains uh, the publication of the event with a letter and referring to it uh, as an uh, important event for all uh, Israel what we are missing is that we have only the introduction and the complication and the complication and the complication but where is the turning point and where is the re resolution it's missing it's simply missing from the document but we have these these, these, these strange lines in the in the manuscript the only uh, only place in the in the page where someone is making any sign of a paragraph and he's using there the sign uh, Pei Lamed Gimel. Everybody who reads me in Hebrew manuscripts would say Perek Lamed Gimel, chapter 33. But there is no chapter 32, there is no ch <laughs> chapter 34. So we are, uh, and these three lines are quite out of order. If you look from the point of the spot, and the word of the governor became asserted over the community that there had to be a trial in, uh, in, um, in a personal combat. And they, the non-Jews, put hands on the, ple on the pledge, on the gold and the silver of the communi community, that they will come and fight on the day of appointment. And then, in, in the same line, he continues, and he ordered to search for the letters, and they did not find them. Okay, one accusation, is, uh, dismissed. Is, is dismissed. And the searchers took out the books from the ends of the houses of the community on Shabbat. They're making a special uh, the search at the homes of the Jews and they saw that there were no and, re did, and returned the books to their owners. And the man, the goldsmith, the artisan who prepared the statue <coughs> says in front of the people that the foe commanded him to do it. This would be the turning point. From here on, there is no accusation anymore, and the, and the, and we have the way open for the resolution of the letter, the deliverance, so, the stage of deliverance. This is and this is written in the middle of the text, and a line afterwards, the complication is going on, and the and the and the, and the characters are are acting as I, as the complication is still going on. So what I want to to introduce is the idea that these three lines were written, were falsely written at this place in the manuscript. And we can explain this in normal cases when 
uh, documents are written in the margins of, of documents and they are segmented uh, by writing them in the in the margins and here a, sh a short part was written in uh, in in the margin of a manuscript and the uh, and the uh, and maybe even that the copy of the text already had problems to to copy his text to the end but he thought that at least the beginning was interesting uh, interesting enough from the pages he saw so we have here uh, the complication the turning point and the missing uh, resolution and end of the letter we would like it very much to have it but we can see that this is the uh, the pattern of a Purim letter of what in later Jewish uh, medieval period and uh, a, a later early modern period becomes a very common way to communicate first time local history when a deliverance uh, took place so I would say this is a literary form and even if we have only a fragment because we have even in fragmented form the point of um, uh, the point of uh, no this is the end we have the uh, we have the point of uh, we have the point of uh, turning point we have in the uh, in the text before us the next question is re evaluation uh, re evaluation of language and style and for everybody who heard uh, Effie reading the text heard most clearly biblical Hebrew yes we have it in the in the lexica we have no word in rabbinical Hebrew we have the name of the localities Blois Loire today we have uh, Limonis Limoges today we have the Astel the the Israelite uh, the Hesed that has a French name Astel yes, uh, and so on but we have no rabbinical words in the text we have a syntax that is with the conversive uh, vav is easily identified by every Israeli as biblical uh, styled Hebrew yes? and it's more uh, paratactic than syntactic every sentence has a w end and end and I tried in my English translation working translation to reproduce it and it's very weary for reading this kind of text and 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 it's and. extremely cumbersome <laughs> yeah. and there is a kind of redu redundancy in the text that everything is said twice or three times with, with almost similar words and this is very interesting when why, when introducing this kind of style is for communication uh, especially if, if you're telling stories and we have the same style in the Megillat Achimatz in this mm -hmm. Al Achimatz scroll when he's not sure that his audience knows the words so he puts some similar words around it should you take it yes and afterwards the Makamat style in uh, in uh, southern France uses exactly the same theory so we are in one step somebody is writing biblical Hebrew with an audience that he has tries to help them a little bit to understand where the plot is and uh, developing when we have this way a lot of parallelism of uh, parallelism of in this in this text and the text is full of intertextuality in the so-called Musiv style every line almost every line there is some part cut and paste from the uh, from biblical text this is one aspect. So the first thing we would say, okay, the writer of this text reveals the knowledge of Hebrew writing in the 10th century. He takes from the Bible, let's say the book of uh, Shmuel, King, uh, Samuel, Kings, uh, and so on, this kind of narrative style, and brings it over to a text he wants to write about the local, of the fate of the local community. But there's also another kind um, of text. Another kind of text in the intertextuality uh, of this letter. Vayakam, Vayakom, you have to read Vayakom Netzer Zadon, Shoresh Nachash, Meeretz Safat, Asher Bekiriat Blois, Ushmo, Schok Ben Aster Yisraeli. This is the kind of, of style, but then we have this crazy connection of words, Netzer Zadon. And we have this kind of pattern of 
a stair around. And then we simply go to the synagogue in France, in Italy, in, in Ashkenaz at these times, and we have the blessing after the reading of the scroll of Esther on Purim Day. And this blessing begins, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Hini Eitzat Goyim Vayefer Machshevot Arumim, Bekum Aleinu Adam Rasha Netzer Zadon Mizera Amalek. We, pr we praise th th that one who uh, uh, annulled the uh, will of the, uh, of, of, the, of the foreign people and um, uh, uh, abolished the, uh, the, the, the thoughts of the uh, wicked ones. When came, when, when came over us a bad person, an evil person, Netzer Zadon. This is exactly this kind of wickedness here. But if you have a look, what has the snake to do with this kind of, uh, of, of wickedness? And if you see in, the, in this piyut, in this, in this in blessing, you see, Vayafer Machshavot Arumim. What means Arum? Arumim. Those who, who plan bad deeds, but it's also those one who is naked after the story of uh, uh, leaving the paradise. So I think this text is far... Or the snake itself. Yes, yeah, Mikol Chayav. So we have here the play, we have here the play with this text uh, in the background. So this person went at least for two, uh, for two kinds of literary texts to the synagogue. One is Bible and the other is um, the other is uh, litur liturgy, and I bring only a short, a short example that he is using exactly this style of Pythonic writing. I don't know how much this, his audience was understanding this, but they could appreciate it because they knew this style. When he is speaking about the plans of this evil person, Schoke Ben Aster, he speaks about that. He spoke to burn the more desirables than God and much fine gold. What does this mean? <laughs> but if I look in the Bible that this describes the words of God, so I know that he's speaking about the Torah. And he speaks about that, that you don't want to leave anybody of the keepers of the resource. To Shia. Again, to Shia is one of the kennings, one of the terms used to describe the Torah. So, we have someone writing in a biblical style, but he was well, uh, he was, uh, uh, I think he was someone using liturg liturgy and uh, liturgical text. So we're living exactly in the first step of literarization, of Hebrew literarization in Europe. We have the same stage in southern, Italy, in southern Italy, we have the same stage in early Ashkenaz, and that uh, the Bible is the basic text, and the liturgy is the framework to know about the Bible and to uh, acquire uh, uh, the, its active use. And then we see that, for example, in Andalusia, the decision is to make this to the public Hebrew language, the Biblical Hebrew and not later words and developed Ar Ar Rabbinic. So, we are, we are in on the stage before Europe changed from Biblical Hebrew to Rabbinical Hebrew as public language. There are two elements that are quite strange in the text. The, the one thing is the use of variation. Variatio delectat, everybody knows who knows European uh, literature, but in Hebrew style, in Biblical style, this is no rule at all for style. So, why he is using ten different kinds of words for this uh, bad guy uh, of this story? Very interesting if this, if this is a static influence from outside, or again, influence from Piyut. But while in some words, he is recalling words from his language background outside the synagogues. And one of the things very interesting that he's not using the word Beit HaKneset for synagogue, but he uses the word Gotzhus, Beit Elohim. Beit Elohim. He's using the Gothic or Frankish word for, uh, uh, for the church. And this is for the church, for the synagogue, for the church, for the synagogue. <laughs> No, he's exactly playing the game on it. Exactly. He's exactly playing the game on it. He knows that the people are thinking about the place of the congregation as God's host, not as synagogue and not as church. So when he's using in the text 
some, sometimes the Christian go to the God's host and someone, the Jews going to the God's host. And then you see that the, that the reader has to make up his mind. And he brings it to a parallelism in, uh, in, in paragraph 8, he brings it to the pa paragraph. After the Duke uh, forces, enforces the, uh, the, 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 combat, uh, the personal combat for trial, yes, and then when the community departed from before the governor, they returned before God. They went to, to, to stand to, in prayers before God. And the men of evil, they took him with him, the leader, the Duke, up to the house of his statue, the Mesquite. And here you see, they make a double movement in this, uh, he, uh, the author makes a double movement. The, the Jews, they departed. And the, and the protagonist of the evil, he's going up, Vayale. Okay? Vayalu. So we see the two movements, and we see that, that this is a, construct, a constructed, very well constructed parallelism of two movements. But the Jews go to their place before God, and the Christians go to their house of the statue. Okay, here we see that he is he's dividing, dividing the two uh, uh, the, the two the two communities, not conversion, but aversion. I don't go to the other belief. I have an aversion to the Christian house of. Uh, the, the, it's not a formal uh, definition of who is Jew. But the Jew is going to the synagogue. Who is the Christian? He is going to the church. Has he ever converted? As it seems probably in the text, no. probably never. It's simply a question of where do you go to? This makes your, uh, this makes your place in, uh, in society. Again, this is what we have from this text. He's never using the word conversion. He's only using the word that there are two ways. One here and one there. And who looks after, uh, after the passage of uh, uh, the paragraph 8 in 9 and 10 sees that the author is working, the author is working on, this, on the subject of the Jewish God's host. He wants that someone, a good man, is going to the God's host on a daily basis. This way is the, uh, is the victim of the murder uh, constituted. Here you see uh, in paragraph 5. And one day the levy arose before sunrise, with the crack of the dawn, intending to go to the house of God, according to his custom from early times. This would be a nice parallelism. And then the author adds, as a day-to-day day, day matter. He wants, to go, wants that, the, that the Jewish people will go to the synagogue in times of distress, in time and on, on daily basis. He's building the, the community around a center, the synagogue. Like the church is built, like, is, is the center of the Christian community. This, I think, is his, uh, his uh, case and his argument. So, from language and style, we are very well in the 10th century. From the style, we can learn that the author is using very uh, diligently the uh, intertextuality with Bible and synagogue literature. Again, this is his case. He wants to bring the Jews to the synagogue. synagogue the Jews didn't went to the synagogue, as it seems too much in these times. And he uses intertextuality uh, uh, to enrich uh, his message that there is a difference between these two kinds of houses. You think there, is, there are God houses in this town? No. There is one house to stand before God and one house to stand before a stone. Okay. And now our case. Okay. Um, I would like to um, stress now um, or look at the re-evaluation of the Jewish um, Christian society as one with no boundaries. Um, and I would like to argue this uh, a bit further. Um, the name, first of all, the name of our protagonist, as it appears in the text, <coughs> as Peter mentioned, is Sechuk. Um, and it's quite unusual. Uh, it may be, as Robert Chazen suggested, a pejorative play on the Hebrew name Yitzchak, uh, or an inverted allusion to the verse from Job 12, uh, 4, I am the laughing stock of my friends, I who called to God and he uh, answered me and just a just and blameless man I am a laughing stock 
קרוא לאלוהים ויענהו, שחוק צדיק תמים, and of course there is a play there that שחוק in Job is of course a צדיק תמים, and here שחוק is the protagonist, the one who is uh, uh, the exactly the opposite. Just to add to this, that he, that he might be, uh, that he might be uh, um, sophisticated in this way, if you see the blessing on uh, the reading of the Megillat, uh, uh, Megillat Esther on, on Purim, you see that he is speaking of Netzer Zadon Mizera Amalek. And how is our protagonist in the story called? Schok ben Aster, the Israelite. Okay. So we have here the problem, they have here the problem that the, that it's not Haman from outside, but someone it's, from within. It's from someone from within. So it might be this kind of use, this kind of sophisticated use with the name uh, is uh, really possible. So turning back to Sechok, Sechok is identified as an Israelite, probably in an attempt to differentiate him from his nemesis in the text, uh, the one who will eventually be murdered, the Leviite, the Levi, uh, and from another protagonist in the Christian text, in the text, the Christian cleric, referred to in the text as a Kohen Labal. So we have a Kohen, a Levi, and an Israeli. Uh, the Kohen is, of course, the Kohen Labal. It's not a regular Kohen. It's not a priest, a Jewish priest, but rather a priest to the god Baal, namely a priest in the church. The Levi, who is the murder victim, and the Israelite, Sechok, the one who performs the murder. And um, again, think about it, where these categories are relevant in daily life, in the synagogue. No, no, no way out. <laughs> Okay. Um, Sechok is described as someone who had abandoned the Jewish faith and preferred worshipping the foreign gods of Esau, a clear reference to Christian worship. But it is noteworthy to mention that the text does not mention any ceremonial or official conversion to Christianity, nor is there any indication of baptism. This is one of the things that struck me uh, um, completely when I first read the text. Schok is, is, is identified time and again as a foe and as an enemy and so on and so forth and he sides with Christians but there's no mention of him being baptized in any form or manner. He and bows only, before the, b b the, 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 the foreign gods but he does not perform a proper conversion from one religion to another. No one of the Christians offers baptism. Only extinction. In yes, the text. In the text. This is the this is the dualism of this uh, this text. Um, we would like to suggest that Sechok may be displaying um, a kind of hybrid religious affiliation, and I know Dove is very averted to this term hybrid, but still. Um, also in this case. Also in this case, <laughs> I would. Um, uh, that may reflect his personal genealogy. Turning back to his uh, introduction as an Israelite, we should bear in mind that in the Bible, as Peter has mentioned, um, which is the template for the text, and where it draws its illusions, associations, and its form of Hebrew language, the term is used in the story of the blasphemer in Leviticus 24.10. Uh, the biblical text identifies the blasphemer as the son of an Israelite woman whose father was an Egyptian. Again, a very confusing tale. Who is who? Who's identified as what? Whose affiliation is in what direction? Um, intermarriage plays in the background. Um, although our text does not say so explicitly, the identification of Sechok as an Israelite, giving his character as it is described in the text, may suggest that the author wanted to invoke the scepter of the biblical blasphemer in his audience. Um, after having explored Christian worship, Sechok is portrayed as someone who began to wander and travel away from his native Blois, abandoning not only his original faith and familial ties, but also the medieval idea of stabilitas. Interestingly, in his travels to the surrounding towns, that's how it's described in the text, in what is described, um, he is attempting uh, to do the following. I shall go in turn to tour the towns and accustom myself in the gatherings of the Gentile people and its God and uh, to each and every folk. And he went from there, from Blois, and came to the towns of the congregations of Israel that he found. Again, this is very misleading. Is he exploring another religion? Is he wandering among the Jewish communities? Again, when he wanders in the surroundings seeking or exploring the foreign gods, um, he still reverts 
into the Jewish system of social help. He is extended charity. He's extended hospitality. One of the things the text invokes is the fact that when he represents himself and introduces himself to other people, he says, I am a Hebrew. Ivri anuchi. This would suggest two things. It would suggest that he was indistinguishable as a Jew externally, so he had to introduce himself, doing so probably in language, and that way uh, disclosing the fact that he was a Jew um, on the one hand. On the other hand, he is going on a trip trying to explore foreign religions, but when he goes to other communities, he reverts to the Jewish community for social help and is extended help by, of course, um, the Jewish women. Okay? Um, when he says, I am a Hebrew, he invokes the age-old uh, um, identity call made by the prophet Jonah, Ivri anuchi ve'et Adonai Elohei ha'shamayim anuchi yareh, uh, from Jonah 1.9. Uh, this allusion seems like a deliberate literary tool intended to further deepen the paradox and the tension between Schok's intention on the one hand and his actual behavior and appearance and appeal to the Jews on the other. Uh, the need to profess one's identity may also tell us that the specific identity, as I said, was indistinguishable. Uh, from his appearance, one could not tell if Schok was a Jew or a Christian. This seems to be a very strong leitmotiv in our text. We are dealing with a society where the contact between members of the two faiths were numerous and the external distinguishable identity markers are very few. By professing a, being a Hebrew, Sechok is said to have gained the assistance of the house of Jacob, Beit Yaakov, possibly a reference uh, to his ability to work his charms on women, on Jewish women, who, turn, uh, who in turn sustain and provide him with food and livelihood, as it says in the text, as is their custom in every city where he arrived. The anonymous author of Sechok's wonder, uh, uh, ties Sechok's wandering to a host of criminal misdeeds. Uh, he is reported to have abused Jewish trust that was bestowed upon him. He is engaged in theft, swindling, cheating. He, his overall conduct is described as extremely in an unfavorable manner to the point that when his true colors are revealed, uh, he was banished and shunned from all these communities that he visited when exploring the foreign gods and the foreign nations. Um, and eventually he's expelled altogether from northern France. This move forced Sechok to travel across political borders. So far he was within the political borders of northern France. He travels across political borders into Aquitaine, as uh, far south as Limoges, away from his native Blois and <clears throat> its surrounding towns and Jewish communities of the Loire Valley. Uh, the choice to immigrate south to Limoges was probably prompted by family ties. Uh, the text tells us that Sechog's maternal aunts lived in Limoges, uh, describes as a described as a peripheral Jewish community on the edge of Tzarfat. Limoges is referred to as a walled city, Habira, suggesting it may have been precariously located by comparison to the more central Loire Valley communities. Another explanation for this mention may be the fact that in the 10th century, the city of Limoges grew around two foci. Um, one was the abbey, and the other was the fortified residence of the Viscount on the site of the future castle of Saint Martial. Uh, Sechok relocated to Limoges, where he would be one of the, where he would, uh, where we are told one of his mother's sisters was married to a stranger, Ishnechal. Again, crossing boundaries, someone who marries with someone who is not from the fold. Um, so the author of the text is trying very deliberately to put forth this notion that the society we're dealing with is a society where the boundaries are extremely, extremely blurred. Um, by now, the negative nature of Sechok's genealogy and dubious nature uh, and the social circles he travels in is firmly ingrained in the minds of the readers of the story. Unlike his previous conduct in when he was wandering, this time, once in Limoges, Sechok rises to prominence and eventually takes over his aunt's household again through marriage. And the text is very dubious whether the girl he marries is the daughter of this intermarriage or someone else. But it seems that the girl he marries or the person he marries is the daughter of an intermarriage. Again, putting this, tightening the lid over this idea of a limitless or uh, a boundless uh, society.
So no, no, you have now the murder case. Ah, murder case. Okay, we're going to do All right. So in Limoj, um, as in his previous life, uh, Sechok is uh, reported to have thieved, killed, fornicated, and sworn fars falsely in a manner suggesting an overall a amoral and criminal behavior. That's why I love him so much. Um, yet, uh, as the list of trans transgressions suggests, uh, he had violated almost every commandment in the Decalogue. Again, not Talmudic, but Decalogue, Biblical. Uh, we shouldn't necessarily take every word of this list as fa at face value, uh, but one thing is for certain. In an attempt to take over property in Limoges, Sechok married into his mother's family, taking over his niece as a wife, and taking over uh, the household of his aunt. When Sechok found uh, that he can take over property, he engages his neighbor, the Leviite, and attempts to discredit him publicly. Again, uh, this is something that the text puts forward. Uh, the reason why Sechok will eventually hire two people to kill the Leviite is because the Leviite is entrenched within the Jewish community of Limoges and entrenched within the non-Jewish community of Limoges. The attempts of Tzchok to discredit this man in the eyes of the entire population of the city are unsuccessful. Again, we're talking about a society where someone is considered to be uh, a proper man, he is considered to be a proper man in both communities, not only within his fold itself. When he meets the formidable resistance against this Leviite and he cannot discredit him, he decides to revert to the age-old method of if you can't beat him, kill him. Uh, and that's what Sechok does. He summons two people uh, from his former city of residence, Blois, and uh, contracted them to do his lethal bidding. The ability to do so suggests not only what kind of circles he traveled in in his previous life, uh, before relocating to Limoges, but also what company uh, he kept in Blois, uh, and also the fact that he could hire these people, bring them across the border, and suggest they do his lethal bidding. We're talking about someone who travels in these circles very freely and is able uh, to produce this kind of uh, uh, criminal deed. Um, now, what happens is the following. The assassins, uh, as we read before, lay in ambush with drawn swords for several nights, awaiting the chance to surprise the Leviite and kill him, uh, but this does not work out. The Levi, it was either warned in advance or simply exercised caution, given the threat to his person. The quarrel he had with Schok was probably the knowledge. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, he knew that this was uh, something that he should be fearful of, and that he knew that the, the uh, Sechok had summoned people from another city uh, to kill him. This fact shouldn't surprise us, especially taking the urban realities of northern France in the 10th century, small towns, a familiar face is a familiar face. If someone shows up on your scope and is unfamiliar, within a short amount of time, you know that he is from outside, but he's stuck around, unlike the run of pilgrims that comes through the city that are too many of the peoples uh, living in the city are indistinguishable. These people, the two assassins, come from Blois, they're very, uh, they're clearly foreign, they stay around, they're identifiable. Um, the arrival of people in town that, unlike other pilgrims, stayed in town for a longer while did not pass unnoticed. This notion of extra caution by the threatened party is strengthened by the fact that he is also said to have avoided leaving his house after dark and changed his daily habit of attending morning services in the local synagogue, fearing an assault. Um, by the way, from the work on my book on Jewish involvement in crime in medieval Europe, I can tell you that just like Italian mafia hits are always in a restaurant, um, when a Jew wants to kill another Jew, walking to the synagogue in the morning is the preferred site of a hit. Uh, I have at least five cases of this happening uh, in various locales, uh, from uh, Spain through France, Germany, and all the way out to Poland. No escape car. No escape car, exactly. Um, it's a schedule. Exactly. It's a, it's a time you can kind of uh, a plan towards, uh, just like you know that a Italian mobster is going to go and to get his cannoli. It's almost the same. Um, probably over the course of some time, the tension that kept the Levy on guard dissolved and eventually an opportunity to harm this man presented itself. 
Um, at a certain point, the Levi resumed his daily morning walk to the synagogue, a detail that did not go unnoticed by Sechok's men, uh, hired assassins, who directed the strike before the crack of dawn. Uh, one day, when the Levi was up very early and go to the house of God, Beit Elohim, um, the two men from Blois awaited him um, and attacked him in the street. They struck him. It should be noticed <clears throat> that it is only at this point of the text that the text mentions that they are non-Jews. Thus far, no mention of the fact that they are non-Jews appears in the text. Even when they're hired, even when Sechok calls for them, only when they strike are they mentioned as Arelim. Uh, another <coughs> attempt to blur the boundaries between Jews and non-Jews. Um, the Levi cries out to help, and all the people of the town arrive, regardless of denomination. Okay? Um, but it is too late. The Levi is mortally wounded uh, and during uh, the speedy assault, and with the last drawing breaths, he manages to disclose to those who came to his aid the names of the assassins, again suggesting that he knows these people. Um, again, the text is very specific about this. He, they are mentioned as men who had no initial quarrel with him. Again, something that resonates also the uh, Germanic uh, legal system from around these people. You have to say that these people did not have a biff beforehand. Um, did the Levi know the uh, assassins from Blois previously? We do not know, and I can't say for sure. Um, but it was these events and the quarrel between Sechok and the assassins that triggered eventually the chain of events that brought about the event that, that is the heart of our text. The assassins fled town in great haste and didn't even collect the pay. Although this is reasonable, it is reasonable to think that they fled back to Blois uh, across the political border, they stuck around anyway because they wanted to collect their pay as we saw before. That is when they threat to put their hand on books and on any other commodities going to and from the Abbey of San Martial. And this is where eventually um, Sechok also turns his back on them. The text does not resolve what happened at the end of this squabble between his assassins uh, and himself. Uh, we do not know what happened. The text immediately moves forward to the story of deliverance. But the reason this uh, uh, um, story of assassination appears in the text before is probably to further enhance the character of Sechok as a uh, indistinguishable persona in between the two faiths, someone who is in both worlds, someone who never may be properly converted but still is uh, um, enough traveling conveniently enough in both worlds and using his abilities to the detriment both of his community and of the people around him. Can enter the synagogue to put the wax figurine that will bring the community in trouble and he can go to the Beit Mosquit to the uh, to the Beit of the statue uh, to go with the Duke to his uh, to, to his religion and to his religious world. So this this kind of status when Jason wrote about his article he looked for, for the conversion. And there was no conversion. And the, what this text, in all its form, in all, its, all the kind of development of the plot uh, reveals, is that the problem is that this kind of guy has 10,000 names. That this kind of guy has a face like everybody, and the and the uh, the borders of the communities are not defined. There are institutions like synagogue and church, but this is, this is, I think, the solution that the writer of this letter wants to produce, but there is no other kind of uh, legal way before. And again, also if you read exactly the wordings about how he marriages the Isnish, it's, it's not clear. They are st st uh, simply living together like most of the people in Europe in this time. What is important is he takes over her property. Yes. That's the, that's the essence of it. Okay. Also, so. Um, this is where we conclude, and we open the floor for your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Voilà. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really interested in huh. Well, you can read all about that when um, Kate Messler, nice who we, we failed to mention, we should. Um, Kate Messler uh, is a postdoc at Minnesota University and is writing 
Uh, you, she's putting together a diplomatic edition of the text based on the two printings and the manuscript and their discrepancies, as we mentioned. Um, she's also translating the text, and the reason that triggered her interest is because she's an expert on medieval magic, and what triggered her interest in the text is the Rache Pupen, the uh, revenge doll that is mentioned in the text. Huh? Voodoo doll. Voodoo doll. Voodoo doll, yes. Are Jews particularly known to be doing this? Why? Why would he use it? Why would he blame it? No, because the Christians are known for it. The Christians are known for it. The Jews are known for it. No, the people of Limoges are known for it. There is no differentiation like this. This is, uh, this is I think, this is the case of this uh, of this text that, like the norm of the uh, legal norm, that you have a quarrel with someone to 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 bring a sword uh, in between the two persons. Yes, if you don't have a quarrel, you don't don't have the right to to attack somebody. Mm -hmm. Yes. So this is known to the Jews, and this is known to the non-Jews. When the Jews are asking for that, there will be no trial by, by combat, they are referring to law that should be known to everybody. It's the and Carolingian so law. And, and so on. So the, 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 the text here is that not the Jews are the magicians. No, it's, plausible, it's a plausibility structure, plausibility structure of this society that if you find a, a wax figurine, you know that someone wants to do something evil to somebody else. And and the, the, the and the artisan is a Christian, as it seems, mm -hmm. who makes it. He's the specialist in doing it, and the, and the Christians are believing it. If Jews are using this, this is evil. The evil Jews. So it's not particularly Jewish magic. <laughs> That's what we're asking. All right. Must have said Nadia, then Guy. Okay. Hi. Okay. Yes. What a, um, you said that uh, this is a copy of a much older text, yes. and I think what I'm going to say really reflects the age of the of the text. Mm -hmm. For once, uh, the fact that the Jews are not distinguished from the surroundings in their dress, for example, or mm -hmm. in their manner, or in any other way, we have to remember this is before Latin and Four. Of before course. The, yes, uh, yes. <laughs> this the is decree that Jews and Muslims need to dress differently and so on. This is obvious. Uh, also, I don't think that the Jews wore any special headdress or headbeards as opposed to other people. I think all of them, and this I can give other examples from other places, but it is really technical. So it is really a society that is pre-lateral for pre the church, the reform in the church in the 11th century and so on. So this lack of boundaries is not so surprising after all, I mean, in this period. If we take it in Yes, we have it, just to read the text uh, this way. It is a very early period, yeah. so that is why all these things look like this. Uh, now, uh, this uh, bad guy, so-called, he might have converted to, to Christianity, but the whole um, formality of the conversion does not interest the writer, probably the original writer. Mm -hmm. he, he might have converted, but the whole issue of, you know, my Zedonim and, uh, you know, all this doesn't appear, doesn't mm. mean that he will convert. But but conversion baptism is also no argument in all the texts. In all the in the dialogues between the Christians and the and the Jews, the c baptism is not standing in, in, at all on the scene. So nobody they're speaking about extinction, exile, or exile. This is the these are the two. These are the options on the table. Yes. So again, this might be the bias of the special author of this uh, Purim letter. Yes. But uh, again, uh, this is I think that that's what we try to say. Don't look for categories in a center for of, uh, dealing with the research of conversion. Yeah. Well, of course, it reminds me for of the Purim of Saragossa, which mm -hmm. is much, much later Purim, but it has some similar elements. Yes. Mm -hmm. Especially the question of the books and looking for the books and yeah, opening yeah. the books. And yeah, yeah, that's so it's a bit of a Okay. Uh, yeah. So, you can just. I so just to just sharpen a point just for my own clarity. So if I reiterate the point that you're making here, is because this is all about blurred boundaries, therefore, conversion is not an issue. Meaning if we're trying to build a thesis out of it, the 
and I think this this is this is entirely something to keep point here that it's a story of non-conversion mm -hmm. because the blurred boundaries make make it not an issue. If there are boundaries, then there's issues of conversion. You move from one state to the other. Mm -hmm. If it's yeah. a fluid state, then conversion is not where it plays. And if you do, then it's separation or <coughs> extinction. It's something much clearer than that. We are under the impression that one of the things that the author of the text is trying to advocate is for clearer boundaries. Um, and he is extremely inhibited by the non-boundary aspects of this society. Um, he, he, as Peter tried to suggest also from the language, he's trying to differentiate, to distinguish between their Beit Maskit and our um, Bet Knesset, Bet Elohim, Bet Knesset. But he's not using the term Bet Knesset, for example, and he's not using. He is. He is. Once. He is. Yeah. He is. once. Once. Oh, okay. It appears once. Okay. It so, appears once in the text. Yes. Sixty-two. Okay. And line seventy, line seventy-seven. Eight. Seventy-seven. Okay. Ah yes, okay. Then seven, yes, okay. Um, Bet Elohim is written first, and then as a, as a variation is written Bet Knesset. Okay. Yes. Well, first of all, thank you. It's a, a, a fascinating text. I have an, a number of questions, but my my first question is uh, why you think why you think this is one text telling one story? Because it seems to me that we have here two totally different stories. Okay, and the break happens to me in line fifty-two. Mm -hmm. Okay, the begin the beginning of paragraph uh, 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 six. Right, where we go from one story which has to do with a murder case mm -hmm. okay, to uh, another story that has to do, which is much more like Purim, and in fact the language that's mm -hmm. used from mm -hmm. line, from line uh, uh, 52 on right, is much more like uh, uh, taken from the uh, Megillah, from, mm -hmm. from, from the book of uh, uh, Estelle. And it seems to me that the again that because it's a late manuscript, and because the manuscript we have is, is is late, it's quite possible that we have here a mesh, uh, a mesh of two, and because the second story has doesn't have to have anything to do. The second part doesn't have any have to have anything to do with Otto, with that same uh, uh, first name, uh, but only with the that, character with, 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 with yeah with that the first uh, uh, man. Because you then have a nine six Vayhi Ishmadon Lecholam, and that could be someone totally. There could be someone totally different, and then begins to, uh, uh, and then begins the story about the donut, about the uh, uh, mm -hmm. the yes. statue, and that, of course, could be. I mean, I haven't read the text enough in in, in uh, uh, detail to to work it out, but it seems to me it's a different story. And then when you come to those three lines that you mentioned, mm -hmm. right now, it to me. The line about uh, the line which refers to line 101, right? Mm -hmm. The text, mm -hmm. and I'm sorry for the translation. Yes. Mm -hmm. I don't know which. Uh, uh, it's in it's paragraph, give the paragraph. paragraph. It's in paragraph, it's in par paragraph eight, right? Paragraph so from eight. just before the end yeah. of paragraph eight, right? The beginning, just before the beginning of paragraph nine. You have v'sfarim hotziu hamchapsim mikze batei haida biyom haShabbat vayiru ki ein veshivum levalehem. That to me is very very reminiscent. Of what we know about what, what was talked about in Paris in 1240, that right, Jews had where, to where, show no on the Yom Shabbat, right, on, on the uh, Shabbat itself, when they knew that the Jews were going to be in the synagogue, right, they searched their houses and took out the copies, right, and took the and confiscated the copies of the uh, mm -hmm. uh, of Talmud, right, of mm -hmm. Talmudic uh, uh, manuscripts. So I'm sort of wondering whether we have here uh, uh, even more a, complicated. I think it's two stories. I think mm -hmm. uh, and not and not one. Two totally different things. And one might be referring one might be referring to 992 in Limoges, but the second story might be from uh, um, um, who knows where. So I think I also uh, think that at least in the first uh, uh, and this is the next point in the first story, there is a case for saying that he did actually convert because of the use of the term Bnei Blial. Right, he's called Blial, which, which, which I think is uh, uh, one Samuel, mm -hmm. right? Where he talk, where, oh Samuel, sorry, mm -hmm. where he talk, where it's referred to Chofni and Pinchas, mm -hmm. yeah. the sons of uh, uh, Eli. Uh, Eli, who are talked about as being, as being, uh, uh, having totally gone away from the path, from the path of the Lord, and they're called Bnei Blial, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And, I, and I think that the but way, it, but, but he can disguise his identity. Right, when he wants to, but it seems to suggest that he that he is to me 
Yes, he, he, he went astray from the, uh, from the ways of God and so on. This is written also already in, in, in clear formulation in the text. But I, this is the argument that I wanted to bring, that there are, an, he's, this person has a number of, a big number of kennings, of, of using of, of terms that is used to, to denominate him in the story. So I would see this as a part of the, of the whole strategy to uh, to name the foe uh, the foe in, in in different in different names, so I wouldn't give too much on it. But again, he yes, he is on this. He's outside. He's against the Jewish community, and the question of if there are two stories or one, I would say okay, the same problem have in the Esther scroll when you have this strange story in the in uh, in the beginning of the plot against uh, Hashbarosh, and afterwards you have the story uh, the. Uh, uh, the rivaling story of two uh, people like Haman and, and Mordechai. So they, they tell first of all they tell the story to give a, uh, to give a, a background, a characterization mm -hmm. of Mordechai. And this, uh, the story in the, in the in the in the gates of the palace has nothing to do with the following story, but it's part of the, the characterization. Conclusion. And here we have the problem that it's not Haman of Amalek. The Agagi. The, here it's the story of the Jew, and try to imagine that this is the star of the following uh, passage. But again, if you are right, we have to we had to look for even in the continuation for more stories. So this would be an, an adapting models of um, storytelling of endangering Jewish communities, and uh, the latter is abrupt uh, has an abrupt end. We have no possibility that there could be more stories. And we have to take this maybe in, into account that this is really an. Uh, not one uh, disposition of text, of one historical event. Uh, again, uh, I see more or less the historical event in writing this text. Yes, I don't want to. I don't even want to go beyond uh, and say what's happened, what happened, what really happened there. But I think first of all, it's an event in the in the history of Hebrew as a European language. <coughs> yes, it's important. Uh, it's an important element. France is. Uh, is writing French. France is writing Hebrew. But, but there's, still, there's still something missing from here in historical context, and whenever you present it at the beginning of this context, I understand that it's a literary event, not mm -hmm. a historical event. For that not purpose. necessarily. Or not necessarily, but let's treat yeah. it like that's okay. what it's, we're, we're treating it now. Yeah. But actually, the history is missing from here, meaning what do we know from other sources about the Jewish community and the Christian community in Limoges in these periods? Why? <laughs> not because I'm trying to turn it into an historical event, because then I can see how they're playing with the reality to create mm -hmm. a literary world. Okay? So we it, don't have the, I, I was hinting to that in, in, in what I said. Um, the next event in line that is recorded and is discussed in at least two sources. Uh, one is uh, Raoul Galbar's uh, histories uh, about the ten, the 1007 and the 1009 persecutions, and the other is, uh, is Adama. Uh, and these two uh, texts present a very similar kind of reality, a community that is ingrained and entrenched within a slightly, but not dramatically larger Christian community on the one hand with a lot of ties to the locality where someone decides to oust them that's that's basically the the, the general outline of the plot of the 10 uh, 1007 1009 persecutions um, and again the what the Christian sources are trying to say about these events that occur about a decade later so to speak if, if we accept the, the timeline here is that there's an attempt to preach to the Jews the truth of the gospel, the, to, to, to turn the eyes to theology away from the everyday encounters which mesh them together. Um, again, this is a, a play on an attempt to differentiate the two communities rather than have them cohabiting as they have been doing so far. Um, and the nature of what we see from both this text, and again, we have very few evidence, especially Hebrew evidence, from, from as early a time as this. This is, if this, for, for this time and place, this is the earliest text we have. We have, you know, we have from southern France, the letters of Agoba of Lyon from, from, from 825. We have a few um, uh, texts from the Carolingian court from the 9th century. But when you start looking for actual evidence, especially within the Jewish community, 
This is the first exemplar that we have. And so we're, one we're of the most important uh, sources for the development of liturgy. Because <laughs> if we can, it's the first reference, for instance, of a piyut ever in Hebrew uh, in French in French literature, in French Hebrew literature. Mm -hmm. And again, we have the first time of a, pu a public fasting uh, reminded here. Hundred years later, the situation will be completely changed. Yes, because autochthonous writing, writing about your own matters. Uh, will be become a uh, common uh, feature, but in this time, this text is really standing. It's the kickoff point. This is one in many points for us. Yes, the the beginning of uh, of history, literary, historical, and liturgy. Yeah, Yeah. Um, I want to ask about. I mean, you you said that this is a plural letter, and it seems I mean, there's so many references. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's the failure. It's easy to say what I mean to me the value of Shushan Ayin Navocha, but he's presented here as kind of an inverted Haman, right? He says specifically that he's not. It's not enough mm -hmm. to just destroy the community. He wants to destroy the whole, uh, the whole, you know, the whole. The, uh, yes. uh, and, and it really follows that. I mean, the Purim story is really one to one. The Quran story also, by the way, the Megillah also doesn't end with salvation, right? There's the salvation and there's another piece. So right. The fact that there's right. that salvation in the middle or what seems to be their acquittal yes, but kind, of, kind of could fit with the, the Megillah story. My question is really, maybe the story of conversion doesn't come up because we're following the Purim story. And in the Purim story, there is no, the conversion is not part of the story. The story yep. is death, well, exile isn't there either, but I mean, that's 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 the central. So conversion yeah. is not. You know, I would it would be, it'd be interesting to if they found the end of the letter. One day. <laughs> They've been trying for the past 150 years. No, no, go, go back to the to, to 1290s or something like this. There would be some uh, uh, copies in, in French communities, mm -hmm. but after 30, 1306, 7, it will be quite problematic to find these kind of copies. But in these collections, in these anthologies, in these uh, pa pa panic uh, books written by French Jews, they wanted to keep their world movable. It's very interesting to see all these manuscripts. Uh, Sarah Offenberg worked on one of these manuscripts that becomes a personal library as a block. It's a, it's a cube-like uh, book where everything that someone could gather... It's a time capsule. A time it's capsule a time of capsule of third, in around 1306. Um, a list of, 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 a, few, of a few dozen um, Hebrew texts copied into one manuscript, all f with the f northern French ambience, uh, as in, a, in an attempt to preserve northern French culture as it is going on the move, um, going both south to uh, Provence and also across the border into Germany. No, my point is just that maybe the discussion here is in, inside the community and not, it doesn't mention, I mean, the fact that a Jew is presented as the Haman here. So why isn't he? Why isn't he? If if he's such a Haman figure, if he's so bad, and he's 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 pre he's presented really bad, um, why fail to mention the fact? I mean, he bowed to the gods of Esau. Okay, so and converted, right? And it's not there. And it's again, not there. It's it's missing. It's yeah. we find the fact that it's missing to resonate very powerfully. Um, you would expect it to show. You would expect it to register. Um, it's not that the, you know, the, 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 the ceremony is missing. People are converting. Um, I mean, we're talking about a world beyond, uh, um, uh, beyond Charlemagne. People are, are, are baptized en masse, right? Um, um, whether they're Germanic tribes or, or, or so on. Why is this failing? Why is the text failing to mention the fact that this Jew, who happens to be a real schmuck, <laughs> uh, he's also a rogue. Yeah, no, exactly, and he's a rogue and everything. So, why not say that he converted? Yes. And again, we have to understand that in France, in these times, all this around Martialis and so on, the missionary ethos is again very extremely powerful. Extremely, extremely powerful. So I would uh, think in around uh, missionary uh, emissaries coming from Gaul, Gaul to going to, to the other ends of non-Christian Europe, yes, I would expect it that, the, that the motive of baptism would ha had to appear, and it does not appear, even if we say that conversion does not appear. 
Yes, but even bapti baptism is not uh, in this in, in this in this part of the story that uh, that we uh, that we got uh, left over. Maybe such a rogue that he even doesn't want to commit to Christianity. He doesn't even <laughs> like add to the. Uh, he does You did. It's even worse. You know, he yeah. doesn't even convert. He doesn't even properly convert. Yeah. <laughs> even by their standards, he's not proper. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Delicious. Okay. okay. <laughs> Uh, I'm looking at all the bad deeds he did, uh, uh, Ganov Ratzov on 928, yeah. Shabbat Shekel, Bikitel Laban, he's doing biblical things. Yeah. It's not biblical to convert. There is no conversion yes. in the and biblical world. And so I think it wouldn't fit in if they actually use word baptism or something that has to do with conversion because it doesn't fit the, set, the language setting. Yes, but Amitai uh, in southern Italy and the people in the Byzantine world know to explain all these bad stories of baptism, false baptism, and so on. Go th take the cure. Yes, going through the through the waters, and they know they know in biblical terms to explain it very Mime well. Maim This is exactly the point. This is not the point. Yes. Okay. So, uh, so you have your point. You have your point that the traditional pattern. Because what's keeping Labat? He's doing Abu He's doing the biblical way of converting. Yes, but again, if you once, if you one day make a Labat, and then on the other day you get your food from the uh, house of ya Jacob so what's the problem in this world that we see here in this letter yes so you can go on the one hand you say you can uh, and on the other hand you want to know the ways of the gods of the other people so without committing to any uh, so I think I think th these uh, give the idea, but I have to admit there is a strong uh, argument in this that the traditional patterns of the biblical text, like uh, the Esther scroll and the biblical uh, way of uh, describing the the relation to uh, to foreign beliefs, yes, this uh, this this could be the reason that in this fragment it's not mentioned, but. We try to read it in the way that it's a little bit too much not to mention it. Uh, no. Okay, yeah. Okay, so direct continuation. So Ganav Ratzach is from Jeremiah, right? Right. And this is exactly the problem. He's not really even Ketel Labal. Ganav Ratzach, Ganav Yishabal Shekha Vakatel Labal, and so on and so on. And then you went and you stood in front of the house that is called Rashmi Alav. The problem is exactly that he's doing all this. Echoz b'ze v'gam b'ze al tanach yadav. All the Jews, he also goes to the house of God every day or early in the morning. And but I also wanted to to ask. Um, you said about rabbinic, biblical, and rabbinic. Um, there is uh, the sifra on uh, Ben Israel, uh, Ben Israel, Israeli, Ben Israel that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. That. Um, in the Bible, uh, the story is that by itself, Ben Isha Israelit, and who Ben Ish Mitzri, betoch Bnei Israel. So it's already yeah, no, yeah. Text, like you said. Right. And the Sifra, I, I don't want to ask. Maybe they do allude to, to this this one because the Sifra says, um, by itself, that why he went out, and this connects to that he goes from town to town. Mm -hmm. That he writes, Yatsam in Bet Dinah Shel Moshe. שבא ליטה או עלו בתוך מחנה דן. אמרו לו, מה תבחה ליטה בתוך מחנה דן? אמר להם, מבנו אוכל אני. אמרו לו, הכתוב אומר, איש על דגלו לבית אבותם. So, he wanted Religion to is defined familiarly. No, you're not from this community, and then he went out, mm. outside. So it's again the story of inside and outside, and yeah. he presumes to be someone, but he's, he isn't, or maybe he is, we don't know exactly. Uh, first, first of all, uh, he when when uh, Effie in his uh, organizing crime, Jewish crime in, in the Middle Ages, uh, has this story about uh, someone in also not uh, not taking his uh, his iron, his ferrum on Shabbat. On Shabbat, yes, yes. It, it appears in in Gregory of Tours. Yes, uh, book, and book six. And again, we see Brisk there that fatal. someone is using Mishnahic law. In a biblical Hebrew world, so, so someone is living according to a biblical text world. On the other hand, there are already rabbinical traditions how to keep Shabbat. Yes, the reference is here in this text is clearly to a biblical re register, but there might be already 
uh, uh, commentaries to the Bible that are according to not written texts for this word, for Torah Shebaal Pei, for the oral for the oral law. Yes, and this would be a case that you would say, okay, wow, maybe this is the background. Like for the other, for the introduction of the character, the opening of the Asher Heni uh, Atzad Goim, Goim is, seems for me is the background of the disposition of the text. Yes, so the the uh, the idea of who do you are and uh, taking the identity, a chameleon like identity in every place I, I am who I am. Yes, it's 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 a possible that this is already related to uh, a commentary to the text of the uh, uh, son of the Israelite. Chana. Um, the sound is from the tribe of Dan, connects to the snake, which connects to the being less pious and more involved in worldly things, and I don't know if I'm going to right here, but it's worth looking into that. And, Indeed. Um, and it's also um, connected to Cologne. Yes, well. And um, also, if we're already talking about the Biblical commentary, I don't know how early the idea circulates that the whole story of Esther happens because Jews were being too close and coming to enjoyment mm. and social social social. So the whole problem of, 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 of Esther and... But this is reading... You, you're it reading... Much, we ha I don't know exactly where it comes in. It just sounds... It, mm -hmm. I, I, me I remembered it and we have, I have to check yes, yeah. when, where, how. And also, um, if there were clear boundaries and he was a Haman for real, then he would have less access. Of course. of course, of course, that's part of part of the argumentation. Part of the argumentation is that because there, no, that's what he's pitching. That's what the author of this text is trying to very subtly pitch. There needs to be a more clear distinction. Um, this may come also from from the Christian side, and we we see this more clearly coming on, especially in the 11th century, where people want things to be more structured. Um, especially after, within the circles of the Gregorian reform and, and later on, uh, you want the ceremonies to happen, you want things to be structured, you want some sort of organizing pattern, and here there is more of a blurred sense of society. On the Jewish side, you hear that this author is trying very hard to say, blurred lines are a uh, recipe for a lot of problems. Fine. Okay. Okay. Lindov. Sorry, who hasn't? <laughs> Huh. You, you and Lindov. No, I, I'm, I'm. I actually don't want to put you any folks on the spot, mm. but uh, um, I wanted to ask you, but via via Yaniv, right? How much perhaps this uh, um, the terminology that we find used in the first part of the text? And I still looking at it again mm. and again. I think it's two totally separate uh, uh, okay. um, events or stories. Mm -hmm. Right. How, uh, whether the first part of the text uh, uh, reflects perhaps a slightly more than, will be a good way of also looking at the uh, uh, Capetian society of 10th century uh, or Christian society of 10th century uh, um, uh, France, or uh, what France was then, because right, perhaps we have here an, a reflection of something that we have Nochrim, we have Arilim, right? We mm -hmm. have Christians, but we have mm -hmm. Nochrim who are, who maybe are. Pagans. Not pagans, right? Well, not yet uh, 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 mm. uh, Christians, right? Mm. You talk. You, I have to say, in a slight comment. You talk about uh, um, the, the Santiago de Compostela, right? Mm -hmm. Or the root Santiago. I'm not sure how how much in. It's just perhaps just at its inception or just beginnings mm -hmm. in the. In it the, is. Uh, no, it's uh, it's, right? so it's, it's ten it's century. Un, it's, so it's unclear if, to. To, if if you're going to have pilgrims going through there, perhaps coming to St. Martial, right? Mm -hmm. But not necessarily going on to. to uh, uh, Santiago yet, but that's uh, 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 just a, a small point. But what, whether we might find there a sort of reflection of uh, the complexity of 10th century uh, um, society? Putting anyone on the phone mm -hmm. on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm hardly a 10th century expert. Um, but the closest to it. The closest to it. Yeah. <laughs> Draw in the fifth. Yeah. Um, Maybe I'd, I'd ask you to clarify what exactly what exactly you would expect to, to find in terms of the, the case complexity. You know, you're, you're looking at the text and 
because I'm, I'm looking in the text and I'm seeing that, and this is what also was uh, 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 Peter tried to say that uh, we find it uh, uh, different, using different biblical words to describe uh, different uh, types types of characters, mm -hmm. and yet we have here, uh, um, you know, perhaps it could be interpreted in a different way, but they're actually looking at what's going on within their broader within their broader uh, society, and they're saying that Christian society is not so Christian yet. Right, you have uh, tenth right. Even in ten, even mm, even in gone. Ten, no, gone, yeah. And not that you have different types of Christians. Mm -hmm. right, you have uh, who are co still coexisting in the same uh, right, in the same space. So perhaps what we have here is also a, a, mu a much better reflection of, uh, of of Christian society. A question. Yeah, well, there was a question mark at the end. Not, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, I have to say I don't see it. I mean, in terms of post-Carolingian mm -hmm. Francia, there's a, at least conceptually a strong push to standardize. Mm -hmm. even, if, even if that's not something that actually trickles down to matures, again. Um, I guess the, well, I mean, you could you can look at the Antiquus uh, Superstitionum mm -hmm. and these kinds of works and, and say, well, okay, there's uh, Christianity in the, in the center, but on the periphery, it's just the Wild West. Everybody's doing whatever they want. Mm -hmm. Vegan. But I mean, other than these very sporadic references to, to, to these practices that are more polemic than mm -hmm. a reflection of anything real going on, I, I, I have to say no. I mean. It's, it's a mess administratively speaking, but in terms of doctrine, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's pretty That's what run the mill stuff. You know, there's not a whole burgeoning scene of, of paganism or heterodoxy mm -hmm. that you would expect to find. And I wonder how much how much Jews would even know to differentiate the theological differences between I don't know, I believe sex and Christianity at this point. I, I'm I'm not looking at it from the Jewish perspective, so I wouldn't know. But mm -hmm. I wouldn't know either. Um, but, but again, I, I, I accept your, your your evaluation. I think that by the 10th century, we're looking at a pretty clear stand, as you said, a pretty clear standard of what Christianity is, especially within urban centers. I mean, Limoges and Blois are not, are, Limoges could be seen as peripheral from the Jewish point of view, where you would have more uh, Jews living in the Loire Valley in these communities, like uh, um, uh, later on Troyes, where Rashi grows up, and, and, and uh, even Paris, uh, and so on, but uh, uh, further north. But um, we're not talking about um, places that are complete, you know, far out there. Th th these are communities that have been established in the second, third centuries, and have been, um, you know, urban centers with their ups and downs. But they're they're not peripheral. It's not countryside um, where you'd find, you know, heresy of that nature. Um, you've got some very serious people sitting in the abbey doing very serious work, disseminating very high-end theological stuff and, and historical stuff at this exact time, so. I was wondering about the etymology of Monte Lucco. Yeah. You know, I automatically thought, well, it's, it's his hammer. Hmm? It's his hammer, that's what Martel? I thought. Automatically yeah. thought. Yeah, so because it's his film. Yeah, you know? it could be. Um, I don't. But the, your, your appraisal. Your book, your book and your hammer. You have a book and your hammer. Your book and your weapon. Your book and your could be. <laughs> no, but again, there are people who murdered with no, books. A book is a book is something movable and very valuable and heavy. And uh, no, th these are bigger books. Yeah. But the but most cases, the books are first of all something that you can take. And in a society with le with less money in use than a uh, hundred years. 200 years later, I think if you want to, to take uh, um, something too to, uh, valuable and to, and to hide it or something else and get uh, uh, money back for it, I think books are very good and we have this stealing of books everywhere for getting uh, in, in Europe uh, and so on. And so I think the, the idea, first of all, of books is fitting the local, uh, if, if Effie's uh, theory is uh, uh, right, we have the local atmosphere of a book center, of an upcoming book center. And again, the other question is that if the, dis the, 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 the distinctive ju uh, use of the house be stand before God and be standing before the mosquito, the stone, uh, the stone statue. 
Yes, that tr three diment dimensional art is becoming after 1975 um, more and more uh, central for the art pro products of the church. Yes, if we have these small ones, uh, this kind big three dimensional statues of the Carolingian time, we have now uh, built up a bigger and and. And most in more central places, I, I suppose. But I, I, I'm not uh, sure about uh, France. I know it from the Rhineland area that the crucifixes is coming up at the end of the 10th century. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, any any other similar uses of uh, the repository of the library as stemming from the name of the library? Of, of what? Because when you said Monte Ludo, I, I imagine you're referring to Montiales. Yeah. So, any any other examples of this kind of uses? No, this is for, for this word. This is I, I looked this no. word up. No, but no. for a locality. I, 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 I like the interpretation. A locality designating 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 the stuff that comes from yeah. it. Yeah. Um, Cluniuto, like, like Cluniuto, <laughs> Cluniuto. Okay, okay. Um, that's a challenge. That is a challenge. I, 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 if you had something like that, 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 that would be, be perfect. Okay. Again, I, I, I think I raised this as, as more of a hypothesis than, and, than a, a, a uh, clear sense that this is what is happening. I think that changing or saying that this is a marculto and this is a scribal error, I think that is a problem. I would prefer this, uh, the Lectio Difficultio, in saying this is Martel Utor and it has something to do either with the Martel or with Saint Martial or whatever, but, but, and not Marculto. It's not Marculto. And he made his point in the, in the question why well, the book is mentioned there. Because no. this is in the beginning very strange, because Sefer means, first of all, the, the Torah scroll. The book. The, the book, the Torah scroll, and, and it seems that, that he's right that I mentioned the, the new medium. These modern laptops are like uh, that you can open them and read in them. Yes, sir. So this is. Do yes, well, concerning Martelluto, there is. You have to explore because I, 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 I am not convinced okay. about the perhaps Mantelus, that is the wrap, the wrap, perhaps okay. the binding, something yeah. that has to do with books, with this book, that is the, the paraphernalia okay. regarding the book. Uh, second concerning con conversion, the focus is is a wicked man mm -hmm. who used religion mm -hmm. in order to get money mm -hmm. from from you know fragile people like like Jews in this mm -hmm. case. The, the focus is not uh, his Christianity, but but his behavior, mm -hmm. and uh, and the relationship is a bit Christianity is ambivalent. On the one hand, is paganism, idolatry, but but general people could be fine mm -hmm. and this is important uh, to say that this doesn't and indeed they do they hybridity and 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 blurred boundaries but different boundaries and okay. uh, it's not the time of ghettos but is a time of going to the synagogue or to the church and mm -hmm. yes. this, this is still a very important ba uh, boundary and finally if at least for me uh, here, when I read, it's not clear concerning the puppet or the doll. Mm -hmm. What is this doll? Because the, it's not clear whether there is the doll of the of the of the sovereign of, or, or the, of Christ. The, no, no, and it's and it's the it's it's the in the ark of the synagogue is the puppet of the uh, of the duke, but. He is reminding him uh, immediately afterwards that this is like the first sin of your forefathers that you did for his year at all. Yeah, uh, but afterwards they are still the the the, the story is still playing that that uh, to make a doll of the uh, of the of the duke and mm -hmm. to make a doll of Christ, they are very very close. It, they, 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 it is playing with the, with 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 that. And you can see, especially, I think, in line 78, mm -hmm. yes, um, mm -hmm. you don't know exactly whether it is Christ or, or the sovereign, or the mm -hmm. when exactly, and it, it, it is going to play with that, and this, this leads me finally not to an hypothesis, but just to remind what uh, 
my colleague and 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 and, and, the, and good friends you can only work out Elliot Doro which mm -hmm. uh, uh, re, uh, make a big research on pouring no. and pouring festivity and the fact that some Jews were accused and the, of building puppets mm -hmm. representing Think a man and Christ Grant. and crucifying and, 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 so, and crucifying yes 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 then it could be here perhaps mm. an echo mm -hmm. a very distant echo yes, mm -hmm. sure. yeah, mm -hmm. of that yeah, mm -hmm. that, that yes. kind of polyphony mm -hmm. on in this mon monophonic uh, text mm. yeah. yeah and I, I and I would just like to have another copy of this text if there is a k if there is a like in this in this formulation you read it would help us for for all but this analogy is not written in the text yeah so you 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 are, you are right because we have only this one copy of the text so it's hard for us to say to bring it to the pin to pinpoint it that is in every case the analogy they are doing to you what they did like they did and the like is missing <laughs> like they did uh, to, to him to to, to to jesus okay so it's it's an interesting uh, but uh, this is the only copy we have and uh, again we tried to to extract this text from the text from the, of the following period just, just uh, let me just say that perhaps I, I am making a, an anachronism but we are not far away from the Ottonian mm -hmm. revival in which the the Ottoman Emperor is compared more and more like Christ mm -hmm. that is there is a kind of mm -hmm. uh, proximity mm -hmm. theo theological political proximity be between the political sovereign mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and, and the Christ yeah, mm -hmm. I, it's yeah. I think Okay. Okay. Um, it's twelve. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to Effie and. Uh,